everybody. Hey, Sequoia. Welcome back to Wild Care. Happy Friday. We are here today, as usual, with Melissa, Wild Care's ambassador, ambassador program manager, and of course, the beautiful Sequoia, the Northern Spotted Owl. And actually, before we get started with our program, uh, I wanted to point out something that one of our viewers uh, sent an email about. So last, on Wednesday, the last video we did, we were talking about snakes, and we were talking about the king snake, and we were talking about how to identify snakes, whether they're venomous or non-venomous. So we used the shape of the head, diamond-shaped head for a, a venomous animal. Uh, if it's shaped like your thumb, it's not a dangerous animal. And also the shape of the pupil that a venomous snake has the slit-shaped pupil and a non-venomous has the round-shaped pupil. Well, this is true in areas where all of your venomous snakes are, are pit vipers. So that's true in California, that's true in most of the United States, the Northern United States, but there is a snake, the coral snake, which is a beautiful snake, but is very, very venomous and has both a thumb-shaped head and a round pupil. So we're gonna post a picture of that on this post as well as on the other one, but we wanted to point out that you cannot always tell if a snake is venomous or not based on the shape of the head and the eyes. Depends on the region you live in. So that is just a caveat, and I would, we would of course feel terrible if someone tried to pick up a coral snake because yeah. his head was shaped like a thumb. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, Melissa, carry on. Okay, so we're here with Sequoia, our northern spotted owl. Sequoia came to Wild Care in 2005 as an owlet, which is what we call young owls, they're called owlets, and um, she fell from her nest and injured her wing on the way down. And as much as we tried to um, rehab and repair that wing, what ended up happening is that she wasn't able to fly silently. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely important for owls because that's how they sneak up on their prey. Right, especially for an owl like Sequoia that lives in a really yes. quiet place. They, mm -hmm. of course, live in those deep, dark redwood forests where you could hear her coming. Yeah, you could hear her coming. Um, the diet that she would go, um, go after is uh, bats, snakes, uh, lizards, and of course the dusky-footed wood rats, Ooh, yeah. the flying squirrels, but the wood rats have great, you know, hearing. So if you're noisy, you're not going to get, um, you're not going to get, uh, be able to sneak up on them and, and eat a nice little wood rat there. Right. So that meant that she was non-releasable, wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to survive in the wild, and she's been at Wild Care, of course, as an ambassador ever since. Yeah, and she's, uh, like our, all of our ambassadors, are really important to help us connect and to educate the public about our species. Um, Sequoia's been doing this for a very, very long time. She's <laughs> completely a wonderful ambassador to have in the program. And uh, in the wild, you know, they don't really live um, too long because they are a threatened species. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit about what their threats are. But with us, or with an ambassador is with us, sometimes we can double or triple their lifespan. Sure, absolutely. Um, and she's she's healthy, she's doing great, um, great weight, everything like that. So uh, we're really fortunate um, with her as our uh, ambassador. Northern Spotted Owl. Or Shannon actually says, is she a barred owl? She is actually a Northern Spotted Owl, and that's an excellent question. There is another species of owl called the barred owl that is uh, a different species, mm -hmm. although strangely they and the Northern Spotted Owl can interbreed. Yes. But there are some significant challenges there. Um, up until about, what, 10 years ago, there were only northern spotted owls in our area of California. But in the last few years, uh, the barred owl has made its way across from the East Coast mm -hmm. to also um, enter the same habitat areas that Sequoia is in. And that's one of the big conservation challenges for the northern spotted owl. Right. And the northern, um, the barred owl, I'm sorry, the barred owl is more aggressive and mm -hmm. it breeds more frequently than the northern spotted owl. So not only just the interbreeding, but also they are out competing them. Mm. Um, and having worked with a barred owl and actually a spotted owl now, um, I can tell you that is definitely the truth. Um, uh, the totally owls, different, right? Yes, the barred owls that I worked with were extremely aggressive. Um, and she, of course, is just very, very calm. She is the chillest owl ever. She is. And, it, of course, you can see the spots. That's where they get the name, the northern spotted owl. Yep. The um, barred owl has much more distinctive yes. bars, lines on his feathers. That's how I remember it. It's like bars of yep. feathers, bars of feathers. That's a barred owl. Um, and so several of different behaviors, adaptations, we'll kind of go over a little bit today. We can start out with the eggs. Um, these are all our... Um, Faux owlets. Excellent. Yeah. So up here is a egg from a gray horned owl. 
Okay. Right? Notice that it's really, really round. It is really round. It's also big. It's also very big. Um, they take over nests. They're not nest builders. So they take over nests from um, other raptor species, most notably a red-tailed hawk. Okay. Same size, take over the same um, nesting. Uh, they like sticks, apparently. They love sticks. So the red tails come in and do all the hard work, and then the <laughs> come in and are kind of, I always describe the great horned owls, they're kind of like the mob of the raptor world. They're real tough. Really? Much wise guys, yeah. Um, of course, over here is a cavity, and those are actually Trill, our screech owl. Eggs, those are her real eggs. She laid eggs for the very, very first time during the pandemic, and uh, that's where she would she would lay her nest or or have a nest is inside a um, hollowed out tree, maybe something by a woodpecker. Um, right, because of course they don't create their own hollows yep. or yep. a natural hollow that occurs into it. it occurs for a tree. Uh, we always tell people when you're trimming trees, of course you want to look for nests, but you also want to look for cavities because you have a lot of different species, including the western screech owl, that nest in those cavities, in those holes in trees. And they're very tiny. I mean, they're like, yeah, they're itty bitty. Tall. If you've ever seen trails, she's I mean. Believe me, she's got a lot of personality smooshed into that little little body. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you definitely want to check those uh, tree cavities for those guys. This is the snowy owl. This is, of course, the um, all, all, uh, arctic owl on the tundra. They, uh, of course, don't have trees there, so right. they are laying their eggs on the rocky ground. Sure. And, of course, barn owls. Yeah. Barn owls, if you're lucky to have a barn owl in your neighborhood. Um, barns, abandoned buildings, a lot of different places that they can A barn owl box that we can, yep. that we, um, so technically use. they're cavity nesters too. Yeah. They just like a, a larger cavity in general, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. And then her, um, old growth redwood forest, that's why they're so important for them. Uh, they, they don't make their own nest, but they will, um, lay their eggs in a, maybe an old dead redwood tree. Okay. Um, pretty high up there. Um, if you think about it, it could be about, it, it was a pretty big fall for her. I mean, if yeah. you think of those redwoods and how high those are. You know, yeah, when we've done place. reunites, getting spotted owls back, they tend yeah. to be quite a significant climb for our arborist volunteers. Yeah. yeah. So one to four is typical. I, one to four is possible, but two is more um, likely. Uh, eggs? Eggs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so her adaptations. Of course, she has giant eyes. That's the very first thing that we notice about she owls. She does have big beautiful eyes. Beautiful eyes. I don't know if you can see it, but they're actually brown. They look black. Everybody thinks her eyes are black. They are actually a dark, beautiful chocolate brown. Um, she has a relatively small skull, and the eyes take up a majority of that skull. Sure. If we wanted to compare that to humans, if we had owl eyeballs in our skull, they do this like Oh, that's rather amazing. Yeah. Ah, that's really interesting. That would be a light, gigantic eyeball in our little heads. How would we look with these going on, right? Ridiculous. And you have your owl skull down mm -hmm. here also. Right, and so on the owl skull, you can see, if you just turn it aside, this is actually a great horned owl, but you can see how much that eyeball takes up that skull. And right here, these are uh, bony, oh, I cannot, eye rings. I cannot remember the exact ah. thing. But what these do is- I can't uh, remember it, the term either, yeah. Right, it's like, ooh, I know what this one. Um, it maintains eye pressure oh, yeah. and gives it form. Uh-huh. That makes perfect so, sense. Yeah. Then that goes into how big are their brains. Now, you know, <laughs> we always hear that owls are wise and, you know, it's all relative. But their, uh, their brains are actually very, very small. Uh, weighs about two pennies. Okay. Ours weighs three pounds. But that's significantly different. Yes. 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 Well, although she's very small and light, too. How much does she weigh? Um, she is about close to 700 grams. Okay. So... Um, and that fluctuates. That's sure. an important thing to uh, point out with our ambassadors is weights fluctuate, seasons yep. change, everything like that. They follow the same, you know, I got to gain weight. It's, it's time to start having babies or laying eggs or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, or it's getting cold, it's getting too hot. I got to drop my weight. So that fluctuates throughout the year, but right now she's around 700. And um, so her ears, uh, are not like our ears. So she has a facial disc here in that circle of feathers right there. <laughs> what is she looking and at? And that directs sound back to her ears. So what happens is when we make sound waves, because that beak is turned down, it doesn't bounce off. She takes that sound and she funnels it all the way back to her ears. Okay. Um, her ears are asymmetrical, meaning one's higher than the other. I love that. So that actually gives them the, uh, the idea of binocular vision. Yeah. Cell phones, pinging off towers, cell sure. towers, and stuff. So we do triangulation. 
Um, so incredible hearing. It depends on the species. Um, I read that barn owls have the best hearing of any land animal on the planet. Interesting. Um, now what makes owls successful is just not only having incredible eyesight that all raptors do is that they're also listening. So if prey is, let's say, under snow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They'll be able to hear that and catch that animal, whereas maybe a red-tailed hawk wouldn't because they're relying on They're their primarily visual. Yep, that makes sense. And because if they have those asymmetrical ears, they're mm -hmm. able to triangulate in on where that rodent would be. I just find that so interesting. Yeah, and I wonder how much she hears of us. You know, like, yeah. like what are her heartbeats? Like, how loud is that for her? Mm, probably very. Yeah, right? that's a good point. She and blinks. Think, and think of how out of rhythm we all are. So, like, a big group of people. And yeah. It's going to be all out of rhythm. But, um, so out of 500 species of raptors, most of those are owls. It's anywhere from, like, over 230 to 250, depending on who you ask. Uh, they're found everywhere except for Antarctica. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, t I'm sorry, 230 something species of owl? 200, 238 to 250 depends on, on who you ask as okay. an ornithologist. Um, there's different subspecies, and of course, I'm sure there's some species out there that we thought were extinct or not. And, right. Um, so, most of those are, are owls there. So, again, very um, successful hunter in the Absolutely. raptor world. And then, of course, her bones in her neck are always amazing. Everybody loves this about the <laughs> owls. Uh, they don't do the full uh, 360 because if you did that, you'd break your neck. That's true. Even but an owl's head would fall off in that situation. That, the joke is they only do that one time. Ah, uh, so, yes, quite. Uh, they have 14 bones in their neck where we have seven. Okay. Makes it more flexible, so they actually can do 270. So we can see if we can get her to do that. So I'm going to make a sound that's going to sound like a mouse. I'm not actually kissing her or anything like that. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> so that's the back of her head. Yep. And she's looking right at me, right? Now where that myth came in is they can do it so quickly, it looked like their head was spinning. Sure, that right? makes sense. Um, so flexible neck, many more um, bones in there. And then we go down to her beautiful, beautiful, beautiful feathers, um, keeping her warm, camouflage. Uh, she is both predator and prey. So we talked about barred owls, right? Right. Um, so, or any other predators too, not just barred owls. But uh, the camouflage helps to keep them safe from other predators. Sure. Right. So then, do the, barred owls actually prey on these guys? Yeah, absolutely. As adults? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a um, really rough out there. Yeah. So, um, and within their own species, they will too. Um, hmm. So it's yeah, it's it's pretty tough. But um, yeah, so the camouflage helps to uh, keep them nice and safe. And um, also on the feathers, they're different than a hawk, a falcon, and a vulture. And this happens to be Vlad's feathers. Oh, very pretty, yes. Um, that he molted, correct? he molted. So we gather the feathers and we use them for educational purposes. You actually cannot keep their feathers. Um, it's against the law because of the Migratory Bird um, Act. So. Uh, we're allowed to because we're permitted to right. um, have the bird for education. So Vlad's feathers, right, are really straight on the edge there. Mm -hmm. You can see that nice sharp edge. Yep. And they don't really bend too well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to see if I can get this. So hopefully it came through. Right. And then, of course, you have <laughs> She's like, feathers. what are you doing? <laughs> and owl feathers have the fringe on the side. Oh, yeah, much softer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm and they're really bendy. Oh yeah, super flexible, that makes sense. And so owls flap their wings slower than um, a vulture. So it sounds like this, so it's just really yep. silent flight. Unbelievable, I think that is so, any, every time I've had a fly, an owl fly over my head, that, that complete silence is so astonishing. You don't even know they've passed unless you happen to be looking up. Well, and that's great for predators too. Right? Sure. So that you can get around. I mean, if you're too noisy, you're gonna draw attention to yourself. Exactly. Right? Of course, she has her um, very powerful talons. That's why we call them raptors. That means in Latin to grab or to seize. So she's grabbing her prey with her um, talons. She has two in the front. And I think I can turn you around here. Maybe she'll let you show them. Two in the back. Oh, yeah. There we go. This talon right here is a reversible toe. Hmm. I mean, it can go forward and backwards and all the way around. It sort of like, like a thumb? Right. It looks like it's broken, but it's not. So what it does is it actually... Um, increases the area in which they can capture sure. uh, their prey. Very powerful. She's just not squeezing you right now. She's just hanging on. 
And um, once she got, she has that prey, uh, of course, she can either tear it up with her hook beak or she can swallow it whole. Right. Uh, they cannot digest, owls cannot digest feathers, furs, or scales. Or bones. Or, or bones. So what happens is uh, once they consume that mouse, let's say, um, the digestion. Oh, she just licked her, licked her lips oh, at the idea like, of a mouse. Mm -hmm. That's funny. You mentioned the M word. Mm -hmm. uh, so the meat gets digested um, from, from the carcass. And then the gizzard actually um, takes the, let's say, fur, bones, and compacts it together okay. to make a pellet. And anywhere from, you know, a few hours to up to 10 hours, they'll cough that pellet back up. I love that. It's one of my favorite things when you find an yeah. owl pellet and you can tear that apart and you can find the little bo articulated bones yeah. of whatever they've been eating recently. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's just fascinating. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's, uh, that's Miss Sequoia and some of her adaptations. She's amazing. Well, Melissa, thank you so much. Awesome. Such an interesting look at amazing at an amazing animal. Everybody, thank you for joining us today. Sorry, my, my camera tends to not focus very well with this light. But uh, so grateful you could all be with us today. Have a safe weekend. Everybody stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you next Wednesday. You can visit us online at discoverwildcare.org. Bye now.